Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Facebook Q&A here from Diabetes Australia. My name is Renza Shabilia. I work at Diabetes Australia, and today I'm joined by Professor Stephen Twig, and we are talking all things diabetes and driving. But before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the lands where we are viewing this. I'm in Wurundjeri land, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Stephen, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Can you please tell everybody about who, who you are? I know who you are. We've worked together for years, but not everyone else does. So could you tell us, please? It's a pleasure to be here, Enzer, and thanks for the invite and from Diabetes Australia. Yes, well, I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, but with the door closed and uh, leads me then not to have to have this mask on, which is great. But um, I'm an endocrinologist, and so that links in with being a diabetes specialist at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney, and uh, linked in as a professor in diabetes and endocrinology at the University of Sydney. So they're my uh, paid daytime jobs. Yes. Um, like all of us, Renza, I wear many hats, and I've tried over a sustained period of many decades to contribute to the diabetes movement and, and um, make helpful contributions for people with diabetes, their carers and, and the profession. Uh, and so I'm a past president of the Australian Diabetes Society going back now more than 10 years. Yeah. And um, I had the real honour and privilege of receiving the Killian Award this year from the Australian Diabetes Society for Leadership in Diabetes. And that covered the, the service and the teaching of next generations and also research that hopefully is making a real positive difference for people with diabetes. Yeah. In diabetes and driving, when I was ADS president so 10 years ago, a couple of us who were elected to that uh, committee uh, then went forward as nominees to help provide support in um, feeding in, if you like, to a key committee that made recommendations about diabetes and driving. And from that time, uh, we did work hard at developing consumer support materials, and that was with the Diabetes Educator Group and more recently over many years with your support and DA, and, and then also fed in with occupational health physicians, et cetera, in terms of trying to get the balance right uh, for the section on diabetes and driving in assessing fitness to drive, recognising here that we it's a privilege to drive, there are safety issues, uh, uh, for the driver, for the passengers, for their pedestrians, and for other people in other vehicles. And that assessing risk and trying to, if you like, optimise the outcome for everyone is one of the challenges that we have. And then there's privacy and other issues. And yet, this is a legislated space, as we know, assessing fitness to drive. There, for health professionals, there are clear um, directives uh, that need to be... And that's the Ost Roads document. Yep. That is my... Uh, email down otherwise it might be recurrent. oh it might be dinging yeah. yeah anyway so i've said a bit there that might help you with some of your other questions yeah absolutely before i launch into lots of questions i do just want to say congratulations on the killian award it was very very well deserved and it does okay. recognize that that really considerable contribution that you have made to the diabetes landscape beyond the day job of wearing the endocrinologist hat. There is so, so much more that you have done. So thank you. As a person living with diabetes, I'd like to say thank you for that. That's really and, nice of you. Thanks, Renzo. Um, now, your work in the, in the driving space is really, I think, really important because one of the things that's super critical is that... Um, advising uh, the, the driving authorities is somebody who understands diabetes and understands the challenges of people with diabetes. So yeah. absolutely, there is really strong um, what we term consumer representation there as well, or, you know, that's, that's thinking about the lived experience. Um, but having sat in those meetings, I know that having um, the authority of a healthcare professional is, is critically important. And one of the things I would like to say, because I know that sometimes people with diabetes probably feel a bit frustrated. It feels like we have all of these requirements. But one of the things I was always so grateful for in those meetings was um, you actually often pushing back because there was sometimes this really unrealistic expectation or understanding about what diabetes is and, and the risks um, posed to, to people with diabetes driving. And I really love the fact that 
that you were very practical about that. So safety first, absolutely yeah. safety first. But yeah. but also we needed to ensure that people with diabetes, that there wasn't an, a, an undue and an unfair burden on us with yeah. what our requirements would be. Um, yeah. But let's start. So, so you've explained, I guess, um, why we need these regulations. But, but what are they? What are they about, and and who are they for? Because there are, there are different regulations depending on the type of diabetes you have. Is that right? Well, that's right. Yes. And so, you know, when we're dealing with vehicles and driving, they're very heavy metals of machinery. Some heavier yeah. than others, and some more complex than others. And once they get up a momentum, they can really, as we know. Uh, through even what might appear to be lower speed vehicle crashes still cause a lot of destruction. And so the issue is, um, how can we minimise that and then optimise outcomes? We know that medical conditions only contribute to a small percentage of uh, crashes, let's call them that, some people say accidents or crashes. Um, but it is possible to identify certain situations where there's an increased risk. And diabetes is not at the top by any means. The, yeah. um, you know, in some ways, age is a critical issue. Uh, in those that are below 16 and uh, above 85, you know, there's real concerns there about uh, clearly a higher general crash risk and related to experience, then also impairments. And then when we come on to diabetes, it's particularly the risk of low glucose, hypoglycemia whilst driving. And then also there's a certain number of long-term complications that could compromise a person's ability to safely um, drive a motor vehicle. Um, but just to flag two conditions that people might, to put it in perspective, might want to be aware of, uh, untreated epilepsy, uh, yes. where seizures can occur behind the wheel, mm -hmm. or untreated sleep apnea, uh, which yeah. becomes a bit more relevant in type 2 diabetes as an associated condition in some people, uh, of course, can be yeah. a significant contributor there. And in contrast, uh, in people with diabetes, it's nearly all about the severe hypoglycemia risk. And this is where a person is unable to treat themselves. Um, I could give you quite a number of examples later on. We'll see how we go. Yeah, let's see how we go, yeah. You know, yeah. across, across type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So getting back to your point, it's the glucose-lowering medicines which are the concern. Yes. It's yes. specifically then those on insulin therapy, but also on some other agents. And, um, and, and there's a certain, certain factors that the, the health professional certainly will take into account the person with diabetes. For example, the biggest risk factor for experiencing severe hypoglycemia, this is an event where a person cannot treat themselves, mm -hmm. is a previous history of severe hypoglycemia. Yeah. After a couple of years, the risks sort of drop back to the general risk of someone with diabetes on insulin therapy. Mm. But, but that is well established, well known, and, and that's a big time risk factor, particularly in the last six months up to two years if a person's had a severe hypo. And yeah. situational factors, as we know, you know, someone can have one in the middle of the night over big night or alcohol yeah. or whatever. And so that uh, is all considered in the total picture for sure. But uh, And the other one is that that lack or impaired awareness of hypoglycemia where the body doesn't signal the lows. And what the literature tells us, and we did have a look uh, in recent years at the published work, is that they're the two significant factors that are clearly increased risk of severe hypos, the, the history of it. Yep. And uh, secondly, if a person doesn't get those early warning uh, symptoms. And um, also without going into great detail, we have looked at coroner's cases in Australia through the Australian Diabetes Society. And in practically every case, they are the ones that you would expect. A person right. wasn't monitoring their glucose, um, had a history of recurrent severe hypos or hypo unawareness, mm -hmm. usually unfortunately was not under regular medical care. And for type one diabetes, we, we would say from the Australian Diabetes Society, that should be specialist team yes. care. Type one diabetes is different. And so, and so, you know, from those perspectives, we can start to pinpoint the individuals who are at particular risk. Now, when you combine that with certain types of driving, some people, of course, drive, you know, will drive a private vehicle not very often, yeah. compared with a commercial vehicle or a large vehicle that someone's doing it for their job. And, yeah. you know, very different scenarios. But yes. Anyway. 
Yeah. So um, just also would like to say to anybody watching, if you do have any questions, now is the time to ask them. You can just use the comments section um, on our Facebook feed and we will get to them. Um, so let's talk about some of the practicalities. Do people with diabetes have to tell their local licensing authority, which is different in every state? I'm in Victoria, it's Vic Roads here, um, but whatever it is, wherever you are, do we need to tell our licensing authority that we have diabetes? Just full disclosure, I do. I'm all very, very um, up to date with making sure that my medical reviews are done. Um, but just more broadly, what, what, what are the yeah. rules around that? Well, essentially, the... The two documents that help, particularly the one, the Austroads Assessing Fitness to Drive, it does indicate if a person is receiving any medication for their diabetes that they need right. to notify. Now, if they're not, if they're on diet and exercise or what we refer to as lifestyle alone, it does vary state by state. Most okay. states don't require it, Renza. Um, but as you pointed out, I think at last look, Victoria did. Um, I think yeah. that was the state that did require that declaration. And you might say, well, why is that declaration required if particularly if a person's not on, you know, especially potent medicines or even medicines that maybe will cause low glucose? Well, we still know, for example, that unfortunately people with diabetes, particularly if they have type 2, they're at higher risk of cardiovascular and other complications. And in terms of having that assessed, you know, can, can help as well um, in terms of reducing risk. But... Um, the, to answer the question briefly, if they're on uh, blood glucose lowering medicine, yeah, notification needed. And if they're not, it varies by state. Yeah. So that's something to um, remember for people with type 2 diabetes if they are uh, moved on to insulin or another glucose lowering. Um, sorry. All right, you're in demand. I am. I'm just going to hang up on that. I'm so sorry, everybody. For some reason, I can't hang up on that. That's going to need to just stop. Oh, oh dear. Technology. It's great when it works. Sorry, we'll just wait for a moment. Oh, my goodness. Um, I put Pasha Bell Cannon on mine recently, so. Oh, that, sounds, that would be way better than that annoying <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that, everyone. All right. Okay. Um, so, yes. So what I was saying was that there is a reminder there that if um, if you do change from um, not being on any medication or change yes. to a glucose-lowering medication, such as insulin or something else, you will need to, um, to notify your licensing authority. Um, okay. So uh, we have... Oh, this is a really interesting question that somebody's asked. It's actually probably more of a question for the police, but let's just talk about this. Can you touch your mobile phone while driving to check your CGM if you're yeah. wearing a CGM? Yeah, nice question, straight to the point. Yeah. Look, look. essentially, you know, the short answer is no. And uh, mm. we've had the challenge here where with the glucose monitoring equipment and say the flash glucose monitor, which, you know, if it didn't have the Bluetooth, and the most recent assessing fitness to drive determination is if a person then needs to use their, their for example, smartphone or whatever reader, then they do need to, to pull over and switch yeah. off the engine. And that's that's uh, consistent with iPhone, smartphone, other, other phones. And so, um, look, I think we have the great advantage, Renza, now with Bluetooth, where if a person's adequately set up, they can receive the alarm at least and mm -hmm. don't have to activate something themselves and then when they get the notification then to appropriately follow through with managing the hypoglycemia and so so I think the short answer is uh, no we're unable to uh, to touch our phone legally and it's a real frustration for all of us but yeah I guess but again safety first and yeah. um, and even if it is just to momentarily check you're looking away from the road and it does yeah. It, it is a distraction um, and I know that that's something that I'm super cautious about I check before I start the car um, I listen for alerts and if I've got someone in the passenger seat they know how to check um, for yeah. me so they can always yeah. keep an eye on my glucose levels if for any reason I'm concerned but yeah, um, same rules don't no touching phones while you're driving I think that that's just something to remember mm. but can um I know that um when CGM first started being used people were not necessarily comfortable with using that as their guide for being safe to drive so we have yeah. our lovely five to drive when your glucose level is five or above you're, you're good to go um 
what do you say about that? Do you think that a, 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 either a continuous glucose um, reading or a flash glucose yeah. reading is safe to go on if, if, and using that as your guide? Yeah. The short answer is yes. I believe now that the devices uh, have that degree of accuracy yeah. and reliability. And it would be worthwhile considering that, as you were saying, the five threshold, that already gives us the fudge factor going from four to five. You know, we... Yes. Most people will not get hypoglycemia symptoms unless they're in the three. Mm. And otherwise, the pseudo, you can always get unusual patterns, but essentially that is the case. And so there's a fudge factor and safety factor already. And um, with some of the newer devices, they're more accurate the, um, uh, than, than previous versions. I did have, interestingly, it was a while ago, a bit over a year ago, uh, I learned from my patients all the time. Of course, they teach me all the time people with diabetes and <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah one got you know 5.2 and he only had about 10 blocks to uh, take his motor go on his motorbike yeah. home but the trend arrow was down and by the uh -huh. time he got home you know he was having a hypo and uh, had we'll call it a mishap up onto the the path up into his drive and uh, I think oh gee you know how did that happen it was 5.2 but the trend arrow was a double down arrow and he thought I'll make it and so I think uh, what we need to consider there is that the, the interstitial monitoring, these sensors, they, they're always lagging a bit behind what's happening in the blood. Yeah. But we've got the advantage of the trend arrows. And this is where if a person takes note, if they're running at a steady level and they're, and they're above five, terrific. But if, if, they're, if they're going down like that, uh, then you can predict that... Uh, already then in the blood they're going to be going down further you know at a, at yeah. a, at a lower level because there's a 10 or 15 minute lag in general yeah and then, and then take note of the trend arrows you know so absolutely if, yeah these yeah. guides are to, to answer your question yes is their general answer yeah. uh, but please take note of the trends and please yep. sensibly the, uh, look, a double down arrow is always cause for being alert um, and and really conscious of of what decisions you're making moving forwards. Because you're right, it could be there could be that lag. We've got a question. So does five to drive? So let's just quickly explain when we're saying five to drive. What do we mean? What what, mm. what does that mean? Just in case anybody would like that yeah. explained to them. Yeah. Well, we we work in Australia off millimoles per litre, and that's the glucose level uh, that. Typically is in the blood, but these sensors, they actually measure the glucose, the real-time ones that are continuous, measure the glucose between the cells. Yes. And But it's still generally reflective of what goes on in the blood, but it, a little bit delayed. So if the glucose is going high in the blood, uh, it will take 10 or 15 minutes, let's say, for it to follow through to the, the uh, levels between the cells. But um, And so the normal range of blood glucose broadly is four up to eight. Let's, let's say that, you know, uh, however, for some people, normal can be a bit below four and, and in other scenarios, you might argue a bit above, but between four and eight millimoles per litre. And low glucose hypoglycemia is low glucose symptoms in general and only start to occur in the three millimole per litre range. And they're the early warning symptoms usually of this sweats and, you know, yeah. tremor, the shakes, palpitations, headache, feeling off and... And, uh, and then if the glucose drops further, then unfortunately with lack of glucose to the brain, it can cause confusion and other, other problems, other symptoms and loss of coordination and difficulty for a person to think uh, in real time and treat themselves. And so, you know, the issue with above five is 5.0 millimoles per litre, where, you know, it's really 5.0 we try and emphasise in the official documentation for the uh, health professional. Um, and you might say, well, isn't four and a half normal? Uh, it's at the lower end of the normal range. And the challenge we have with the finger prick devices, as well as these other devices, is that at best they're about 15% accurate. You yeah. know? Um, and so when you start doing the math, you say, well, hang on, five could be low fours. So that's why we're basically saying, uh, don't be below five. Yeah, be above five to drive was the old catch cry, but then as we know, it's yeah, uh, aligned to that these days. Of course. Yeah, it's a very good guide and it rhymes. Yeah. So we love something that's a little bit like that. So, yeah. so, the, yeah, so don't, the, don't drive under five now. Is it? Drive under yeah. five. I mean, I like a positive commandment rather than a negative one. But <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, a question that's Does five to drive um, still apply to metformin, SGLT2s, or is it really only for um, glucose lowering medications? 
Yeah, so the true really risky ones are insulin, as we've talked about, and then particularly one class of sulfonylureas. Now, um, you might say then, can any of those other ones cause low glucose? And they can. Yeah, yeah, okay. We see people with type 2 diabetes, uh, pre-diabetes, sorry, um, before type 2 diabetes, they get reactive hypos. But, um, and I, I know that, uh, well, you know, again, my patients teach me. Some years ago, I had a patient who, when she was with type 2, when she was on metformin and garden, she had clear recurrent hypoglycemia, but metformin alone. But right. she gardened, she was no problem. And if she was met formed, no problem. But the two in combination clearly caused hypos. Oh, yeah. Back in the literature, it is reported. Even with metformin, you think, oh, that drug's very benign. It shouldn't mm. be to lows. Anyway, we published it in the British Journal of Diabetes and Vascular Disease. And even going back to the big study in the type 2 diabetes UK PDS, they recognise that metformin alone can contribute to low glucose. So, so. You know, the question is, well, is it going to be the severe one and isn't the risk relatively low? And the short answer is, yes, it is. It right. is low. Um, okay. uh, and so, um, so, you know, we generally would recommend that people on insulin therapy certainly monitor their glucose and people at risk of hypoglycemia would monitor their glucose. And in practice, that means someone on insulin or insulin with uh, sulfonylurea or sulfonylurea alone. So that the glycolazide, dimicron, other medicines of that class, yep. uh, they're the ones in particular. So if, if a hypo is going to occur with these other medicines, normally it will be, um, I hate to use the term mild, I'll call it non-severe okay. um, because it really knocks people around, but they can treat it. They're yep. able to treat it, yeah, recognise it and treat it. Okay. Now we've got a question that is a Queensland specific question. So the response to this might be you, you will need to check with the Queensland Driving Authority. Um, but the question is in Queensland, there are new five or more driving rules for people with diabetes and people now need to test their glucose levels before they drive and uh, each time and every two hours on a long trip. Yeah. Um, so blood glucose meters need to be um, have the right time and date just in case they uh, uh, the police ask to see it. Are these rules the same for every state? I don't know that they are. Yeah, um, thanks, Renta. Interesting. Yeah. The, yeah. um, look, there is a really good NDSS Diabetes Australia yes. document. Uh, We're going to share it. Diabetes yep. Services Scheme. And yeah. I'd encourage all our attendees to be aware of it. It's easy to access online. Even I was able to find it again this morning, the updated one. So that's a pretty good sign. Yeah. It's called Diabetes and Driving, Don't Drive Under Five. Yes. And, and it does reinforce a variety of the points uh, that link in with the um, Clinician Assessing Fitness to Drive Ostroads document, which is the yep. legislative document. And it is, it is the case. Uh, check prior to driving mm -hmm. and then every two hours. So if a right. person's on a trip, you know, in many parts of Australia, we have revive, you know, survive and uh, during the Alive, yep, yep. And, and then um, and then the timing of that then is aligned to that. But it does reflect, of course, that the glucose levels can change over time. Yeah. But so that time interval is recommended. Now, as part of good practice, a person needs to have their glucose meter appropriately calibrated with date and time. Yeah. And, you know, if, if it eventuates, let's say that there were non-English speaking or other challenges or someone had a new device or it hadn't been done, well, then, of course, um, we, I'm sure the situational issues would be looked at at the time. But um, so as far as those components are concerned, the, the documents uh, do not say it absolutely has to be calibrated to this date and time. It's taken as a given that a person right. will have an appropriate... Uh, uh, accurate meter which is also going to show the appropriate date and time but we know in reality agreed renter it doesn't always yep. happen mm, that way yeah absolutely let's talk about um what happens so diabetes complications unfortunately are a reality for a lot of people living with diabetes mm. um, how do they impact on um being able to maintain a driver's license so let's ask a, i'll just ask um, a couple of um specific ones let's talk about people who have noticed some um changes with their eyes and and what the requirements there might be yeah thank you so that's right. I mean, complications in diabetes, we, we try to focus on living healthy and longer. And we think about it very broadly. There's, yeah. there's, there's psychological challenges and then the physical ones. And I, these days, it's interesting, some people have complications, challenges with acute hypoglycemia, but not long-term complications. 
so and others vice versa and some all the spectrum unfortunately but if we consider the long-term complications of diabetes as you were saying one of the classic is is eyes and uh, and uh, uh, particularly related to um, yeah, loss of vision in some way. Mm. The assessing fitness to drive documents, they do, and in each state in the driver licence authority has a significant section about vision, and there is a separate section too in assessing fitness to drive on it. And um, two issues are important. One, uh, firstly, is what's called the visual acuity, and that might be the reading type of thing and how, how um, accurately a person can look at the fine detail, and that's the central part of vision. Mm -hmm. The second issue is the periphery of the vision, out to the sides. And so both are important, but particularly the central vision, especially important for a person uh, when they're driving. And, and we know that's then what's called the visual acuity. And so our audience will be aware of the uh, glasses uh, issue. And yep. for example, um, I've got my glasses in my car. Now I always use my glasses on, you know, short, short sighted. And so... Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the nature of it. In, yeah. With diabetes, then, there are certain visual acuity cutoffs as there are for the general community with vision. And, um, you know, if we say with a standard Snell and Chart visual acuity, if a person's uh, vision is significantly impaired in that finer central vision, then if it's uh, worse than what's called 6 on 18, say 6 on 6 would be normal, uh, 6 yeah. on 5, pretty good, yeah. uh, even better. Um, but if it's really getting to that significant impairment, even if a person might have some vision but not quite enough, then then you can have a scenario where, for practical purposes, yeah, it's felt that they're too compromised to drive. Right. And so, um, so you know, some challenges are if a person had one eye, they don't have the binocular vision, they don't have the visual field. That would be difficult for some commercial drivers, in particular, uh, yeah. in scenarios. Yeah. And then in the visual acuity, that's the other issue to do with that finer vision, particularly the central vision. Um, and so, you know, many people have degrees of uh, diabetic, diabetes retinopathy. Um, uh, sometimes it doesn't affect vision at all. Sometimes it affects vision to a degree. Yeah. It, it doesn't get to the threshold that will uh, mean that a person cannot drive. So there are so many people yeah. who yeah. have visual impairments. And if you consider the elderly with macular degeneration and the scenario with uh, uh, cataracts as well, which uh, or corneal um, you know, lesions, which are not readily treatable sometimes. Um, and so, um, so it's not an all or none, it needs a careful yeah. assessment. And uh, I rely upon the optometrist and ophthalmologist if there's any concern um, yep. to put in context the situation. Yep. Yeah. We had an issue in Victoria around this for quite some time. I, I think it, I think we've got it sorted now, but all people with diabetes or a significant number of people with diabetes, when we were being asked to do our twice or every two years um, medical review, which I have filled out by my endocrinologist, some people get their GP to do it, um, but suddenly we were automatically being asked to do an eye check as well, even if we had no reported mm. um, vision issues that would affect driving. So I wear glasses, but I am long sighted. So I don't wear glasses when I'm driving. I only read it for looking at a computer and reading. Mm. Um, and suddenly we were being expected to do this. And um, I know that that um, Diabetes Victoria was getting a lot of queries from people mm -hmm. saying, I'm a bit confused, you know, now I need to make an appointment and I've got to go do this and I might need to pay for it. Um, and nowhere in the guidelines did it say yeah. that this was a requirement. So yeah. um, do, you, do you, have you heard about that as well? well? Well, I would say, yeah, it sounds like an overstepper and overcall yeah. for me. I mean, if it was Another thing you might say, gouging, if they know, like it's, yeah, a, it's, a bit. <laughs> it's just, go, just going too far. If a person's yeah. had their health check and it's uh, in the driver license authority form and some are online these days and some are still hard copy, but it, the visual acuity needs to be identified and signed yeah. up. And, and, you know, I'm very, always very thankful if the uh, optometrist or ophthalmologist will do it, but um, I have the ability also to do it in my rooms and with a pinhole and get an accurate reading. and. Uh, and that's necessary anyway. I agree, Renza. So uh, no need then for the, yeah, there's been, unfortunately, that suggests to me that an overinterpretation of the situation, it's probably because we can do it, you know, and mm -hmm. check yeah. the vision. But if a person with diabetes has had the appropriate checks done, that should 
be yeah. adequate. And as you were saying, go no further than that. No. And so I just can give a bit of advice here because this has happened to me twice now when I have submitted or when my endocrinologist has submitted my review, which, you know, there's no issues with my, my vision at all. And then I got a letter saying, yep, all that's all fine, but you'll now need to get um, something from an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. And I called Vic Rose on both cases and said, can you explain to me why? Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting because, you know, the default response was all people with diabetes um, have I. Um, have vision problems so that's why you have mm. to have this checked and and you know it, it was a very clear you know my position very clearly is show me where that requirement is in the yeah. guidelines because it's not yeah. it's not there so if anyone yeah. has any issues a call to your licensing authority um and call your local diabetes australia first if you need any advice on that but um mm. it's not a standard requirement unless there have been issues identified that need to be followed up yeah. Right. Okay. While we're on talking about complications, um, what about for people? So, some a question here. Um, my feet feel numb and painful, and I have trouble feeling the pedals when I drive. Can I still drive? What's the deal yeah. with, with that? Yeah. Well, that certainly is of concern, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, again, nerve damage in the feet uh, as time goes on is very common in people with diabetes and um, irrespective type one or two. Uh, and um, it would be more than 50% of people will develop some reduced sensation in their feet. And in some people, sadly, yeah, there's pain elements, probably about 20% uh, yeah, of people with diabetes will develop a degree of painful neuropathy. Yeah. Now, it's the one where there's reduced sensation, which is the risk from the driving point of view, because if a person has difficulty feeling, in this case, the pedals, uh, that's a real concern. Now, um, People with diabetes will know that they have their feet checked and they have tests done, for example, a monofilament, which is like a little bit of fishing line. Yeah. Tests. And, and that's a good test because um, if a person can't feel that, then it means they've got significant uh, nerve damage or neuropathy. Right, okay. So most people who have neuropathy will be much, much milder. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, but, you know, from the point of view of the loss of feeling in the feet, I mean, the... Yeah. The paresthesia or the, or the pins and needles or the, or the numbness uh, can still be a very significant symptom, of course, but in terms of the loss of sensation, most people with diabetes who have the, those prob the problem with neuropathy will not have what's called dense neuropathy, where mm -hmm. if you can't feel the pedals, then that really is indicating quite dense neuropathy. Right. And this is very important, Renza, because we know that um, We've learned, for example, from the elderly that a lot of accidents, a lot of crashes, of significant ones are caused by putting the foot on the accelerator rather than the brake. Okay. And, and in Japan, all their new cars disengage, uh, have process of disengaging when a person, when they sense that a person's put their foot on the accelerator and, oh, and right. disengages the pedals. Yeah. But we don't have that routinely in Australia, unfortunately. Yeah. And, you know, we've had some terrible situations of, uh, of deaths uh, in New South Wales in recent years where, mm -hmm. where particularly an elderly person might mistake the accelerator for the brake. Now, in this situation that you're describing here, it's... Uh, a situation where you could argue that a person should not be driving if they cannot readily distinguish between the accelerator and brake. Uh, we're talking about an automatic vehicle here. Unless there could be some modification to their vehicle. And right. we do have some people with diabetes who have uh, all the controls um, with the um, next to the steering wheel, like the old gear shift, but have it all yeah. the tang controls. Mm -hmm. So vehicles can be modified appropriately for an individual so that, um, and as you, you'd know, in terms of neuropathy, it, develop, it comes on much more marked in the feet because those nerves are much longer right down to yeah. the feet from the spine. Um, and so uh, it is, if a person has a history of foot ulcers and they can't feel their feet, certainly that's an area to be aware of and concerned about how much feeling do they have and how much is required from the point of view of um, accurately, you know, reliably managing a vehicle. Yeah. In my experience, uh, most people with neuropathy have no problem feeling the uh, pedals and um, it would have to be uh, marked loss of sensation, not able to feel the monofilament, and even the pressure effect then of, uh, of being on the accelerator and brake. And so it's a minority of people, but yeah, if that person has that problem, 
definitely it could lead to not being able to try to drive at least a regular vehicle. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, we've got a couple of uh, questions. So somebody said, yep. is Ozemp oh, sorry, Ozempic a glucose lowering medication? Yeah, well, it's it's certainly a glucose lowering medication. It's not prone to cause hypoglycemia. Ozempic okay. is one of the terrific new agents. Yeah. Uh, uh, semaglutide uh, once weekly uh, helps with uh, improved glucose weight loss uh, in particular. And um, uh, but alone, look, it would be very unlikely to cause hypo low glucose hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. but sometimes when these medicines are used in combination, for example. One of the indications nationally is it can be used with metformin and sulfonylurea. Now, there are other tablets and, yeah. and, and the sulfonylureas are prone to cause lows. So if you add a Zempic in, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, it could contribute, even though it's not directly causing hypoglycemia, low blood glucose, let's say below four. Yeah. So it's a glucose lowering medicine, but we refer to anti-hyperglycemic. It takes glucose from high to to typically normal, but uh, not into the low range unless someone's on something else. Okay. Now we've spoken a lot about why we need to be very conscious of hypos and low glucose levels and how they can be dangerous in our driving. Let's now talk about higher glucose levels. How can um, being hyper having uh, being in hyperglycemia? How could that affect people's ability to drive and their and and the way that they're driving? Yes, I remember. Thank you. I remember some years ago we looked at the uh, evidence for this, and yeah. look, people will tell you, tell you with diabetes, some of them that it really does affect their thinking, at least their their high level cognitive function. And some people say they hate to be high, particularly say in an exam situation, etc. Uh, the studies, and you could imagine it can be difficult to do these controlled studies, but the ones which have been done, some people are much more affected than others in terms of their reaction speed, but also in particular that higher level functioning and thinking. But then on top of that, you could imagine if someone's having persisting high glucose, you know, they're passing more urine, they're feeling thirsty, they might be getting cramps and low in energy. So there are a number of reasons generally why high glucose either suddenly within, you know, minutes to hours or longer can contribute to making a person feeling unwell. Hmm. And um, probably the most dangerous one in a type 1 and type 2 diabetes setting is if a, if a person's going into that diabetic ketoacidosis, you know, where they, let's say, usually will be well in the double figures, quite symptomatic of high glucose and then nausea and vomiting. And then it can really affect a person's ability to function. Their blood pressure can drop, et cetera. And in type 2 diabetes, a severe crisis is a hyperosmolar scenario that could even lead to coma, you know, so the nasty infection yeah. on top of it. So in that situation, at the most extreme, high glucose can make the person unconscious, you know, mm. but they'd have to be feel and look and be quite sick. Um, but let's say, let's say in a much milder situation or day-to-day -day function, um, a person's glucose is in the double figures, mid-teens mid or higher, most people will manage with that quite okay, but yep. some people will say, yeah, they have to be more careful. They yes. they find that, yeah, that does lead to some loss of attention um, uh, on the road. So, so we don't have evidence that the high glucose levels cause a significant problem with crashes or crash risk. Yeah. Um, but each person should take that into account and mm. imagine if you're not feeling well on a particular day well as you were saying if you've got loved one or someone else that can drive and you can be a passenger well yeah. and so so there isn't a, a specific cut off there about saying you know don't drive yep. but everyone needs to be sensible yeah i think that 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 is really important and i think that was one of the things that i guess we really um were quite challenged about with the the latest guidelines because yeah. There had been something about that and it was a yeah. blanket statement, but yeah. that individual, you know, talking about this with your health professional, about your personal experience is really important. Um, because I agree. Because, yeah, people were... I agree, Brenda. Yeah. And the yeah. HBA1C was the other thing, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah, what it was. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, really, it, it didn't link to crash risk, the HBA1C. Yeah. So that's the three-month test. It's good that's not in there. It's out. Yes. So, so well, it, that. Well, thank you. I think that you and I were a very united voice uh, in those yep. meetings, but that's something yep. probably worth um, mentioning. So if 
you know, there are reasons if you have high, you know, persistently high glucose levels that that you may be, there may be advice not to drive. And, and Stephen's just explained those, but it is not a blanket rule. It is not based on A1C. So, you know, a, a healthcare professional saying, no, sorry, can't sign this because your HbA1c is X number. Um, there needs to be a very clear understanding of why that is relevant to you because it is not a, there is no upper limit number that, that determines that. So if, if that, if you're hearing that again not in the guidelines talk to your local diabetes organization they can certainly have a have a chat with you about that um, i'm going to ask you a sneaky question that isn't driving related but diabetes australia has been consistently and continues to be very much um, promoting people with diabetes being vaccinated and so we've actually got a question in here about covid yeah. vaccinations do you recommend a booster vaccine for people with type 1 diabetes after six months um and yeah, i know that we're not really kind of talking boosters but for those of us who did get vaxxed really early on and i was mm. one of those people i'm getting close to that six months so i know that we're starting to see people asking those questions online we are going to come back to driving we're not done with driving but just i just thought we'd quickly sneak this one in thanks renza uh the short answer is i suddenly I, you know i have to say watch this space and yeah you know yeah, yeah, yeah. many many of our health professionals as well are more than six months since their first yeah. vaccinations and their front line yes and, uh we are seeking guidance and advice in the setting of watching what they're doing in the us and i think I think the short answer is, you know, there's a big focus on helping to get everyone vaccinated who is able to and wants to be vaccinated, mm -hmm. their first and second shots. And, but I think we are going to see this issue addressed this calendar year. Yeah. Um, and uh, clear guidance as to that issue of the booster. Yeah. We, uh, we also have the challenges, some people are getting the uh, COVID antibody test and if they don't have antibodies, then what does that mean and should they have a booster? And mm. we don't have answers at this stage. And all I can say is I would strongly encourage people with diabetes to get vaccinated. Yes. Um, you know, there were still some very rare adverse outcomes, I think, uh, uh, related to the AstraZeneca early on, someone had diabetes. Well, then many people didn't have diabetes. and. At the end of the day, uh, if a person with diabetes develops COVID and they're not vaccinated, they're at much higher risk of ending up in intensive care and being an extremist. And uh, we've just seen that again and again and again. And, you know, in my mind, initially, it seemed to be type 2 only, but then the data with respect to type 1 diabetes does tend to reflect it as well. So, so I think watch this space about the booster and hopefully yes. it will be informed in a timely manner. You yep. know, Victoria might be informed earlier than New South Wales. I don't know. We'll wait and see. It could be the All other right. way around. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And um, yes, Diabetes Australia is, you know, regularly updating any news um, that we have around um, vaccines, especially in relation to people with diabetes. So do keep an eye on all of our socials and on our website because that's, um, you know, where we're sharing that information. We are really just about to wrap up, but I've got a couple of last questions if we can okay, get very to focused questions. answers. I know I carry on. Right? A, no, yeah, no, okay, no, good. this is all brilliant. It's wonderful. So somebody said that they're having their reviews done annually. Um, um, to get their, their license renewed or their license um, continued there. Um, but with somebody whose management, um, you know, is, is tighter, they have no complications, could this in, um, interval be increased to every three years, for example? It's not three years anywhere, is it? What, 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 what are the, how often do we need to have our reviews? Mine's every two right. years. Yeah, fair enough. Look, the annual review is for commercial driving typically. Right. And, uh, we can understand why that is. The risk is higher if the yep. person has complications or hypoglycemia, okay. and so the, the threshold's higher. But otherwise, you know, it gets back to conditional or unconditional yeah. licence. But, yeah, two, even up to five years, if it's an unconditional licence, for example, mm -hmm. Uh, conditional licenses with a private vehicle license can be two years yep. and so it's a matter that person should have a discussion with their health professional that um, you know it, it depends if they're on insulin therapy then that will be more restrictive in the type of vehicle they drive but if they're not on insulin then certainly Renzer I think uh, two years may well be a possibility for them they can discuss yeah. it with their doctor. Okay their good and Another one, this again might be for the police, but perhaps if you can share if you've heard any examples of this. Could the police pull someone over and ask them to check their glucose levels in front of them? I've never mm. heard of that happening, but it might. Um, and what if their glucose level is under five? Um, yeah. 
what what what's the deal there? Have you heard of any, that happening? Well, well, it is interesting with the difficulties as well with the whole COVID period. It's uh, becoming less and less clear what are our civil and individual rights in some ways. But yeah. but uh, essentially, um, my understanding is that uh, the police wouldn't have that right to do that. They might suggest it. Mm -hmm. uh, when the paramedics come as far as medical therapy goes and making yeah. an assessment, then then they have the um, certainly the ability to undertake that and it would be recommended if, uh, if, if paramedics would need to be called. And so I believe that would be at the discretion of the, uh, the individual. Now, the police, however, may request uh, evidence that the glucose level is, uh, is not low yeah. um, at, the, at the time. Okay. Um, and then it's up, you know, there's documentation made uh, both at the level of the police and also the paramedics. And mm -hmm. so then it, it goes from there. So wonderful. Yep. Stephen, thank you so, so much. I, w this is one of those um, topics that we are constantly getting asked about. People, are, are, you know, message us frequently um, with questions about driving and diabetes. So thank you so much for, Th for That's a pleasure, Renta. I might just make one other point if we've got 30 yes. seconds. Oh, people oh no, we've got time. Go. Okay. Yes. People who live rural and regional, you know, the yes. difficulty is that um, particularly for some licences, it says the specialist has to yes. make the assessment. There is wiggle room. It gets back to the point you made earlier, Renza, that, for example, um, I go out to the far west of New South Wales and mm -hmm. we can devolve uh, that assessment if we make it as a specialist. Uh, request the driver license authority enable a regular general practitioner to undertake the assessment. Okay. Yep. And uh, there is also clearly room for a general physician who is comfortable undertaking uh, the diabetes assessment. So uh, people should just take take that on board. There, uh, it will depend on their individual circumstance, but uh, but there is documentation there to not try and create uh, impediments with respect to this process yeah uh, but to try and streamline it as much as possible for the person with diabetes and still focusing on that safety yeah and again Stephen that was something that you know we're so grateful for that you were advocating that when we were in these meetings and and we don't want to add extra burden to people with diabetes we want everybody to be safe on the roads but it shouldn't be impossible to be safe so thank you very much that's a great point thanks for raising that we this will be available on our facebook page forevermore so if you can share it you can tag people in it who you think might find it um, interesting you can come back and watch it again and keep the conversation going in the comments section it will also be on our youtube channel so we will share it and then then you can share it any way you would like to. Stephen, always a delight to speak to you. Cannot wait until COVID is over so that I can see you in person, congratulate you again on your Kellyanne and catch up properly. But thank you very, very much for being with us today. We could share a shandy as well, yeah. Excellent. We could definitely do that. Let's <laughs> promise to do that. Share yeah. a shandy. That sounds delightful. <laughs> yeah, look, thank you. I've really enjoyed it, Renza, as always. Thank Great. you. Thank you. All thank you very much. To our audience. And we'll end our broadcast now. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.